I wanted to take a couple more minutes to look at what you should be knowing about the different research papers and how you should approach preparing to answer questions about them. First of all, and most importantly, you're not responsible for the entire research paper, but only the parts that we discuss in class. There are, um, as I outlined before, really five main things that you should know about every paper. The scientific question, the um, uh, experimental manipulations, the measurements, um, the results that they observed, and the relationship between the results and the question, which is also known as the conclusion. Um, in the exam topics guide on the last few pages, I go into more detail about this and a few other related ideas and questions you can ask along the way that lead into and expand upon those five main questions. What I wanted to talk about right now, however, is some of the kinds of questions you might see on an exam and how to approach them. The first kind of question that you might see on an exam is a question that asks you about factual information in the paper and the relationship between those ideas, the five main ones that I outlined in class and in previous videos, and the more detailed set here. For example, in this paper, I might ask you how the researchers came to the conclusion that mice with OCD-like symptoms have weakened postsynaptic receptors or fewer postsynaptic receptors at the orbital frontal cortex to um, striatum synapse. Uh, I would specify for you in the problem that you do not need to explain how they concluded that these mice have OCD-like symptoms. So you can just say they have these SAPAP3 mice which they showed, which they showed to have OCD-like symptoms. Um, the first step in demonstrating that the synapses from the orbital frontal cortex to the striatum are weaker was to compare in mice that have the SAPAP3 gene mutated versus wild type or control mice that have no mutations, what is the strength of the synaptic input? And the um, observation here is that the synaptic inputs are weaker. The size of the response is lower. Then the next thing you would have to do is to say how they tested whether this was presynaptic or postsynaptic. That's a much more involved explanation and requires you to refer back to this discussion of how you make inferences. Very critical in all of this is being very clear about what the researchers are doing, what they're stimulating, what the researchers are observing, that they're recording either one response or the response to a pair of stimulations, the measurement, what those observations are, so for example, weaker first response, but same ratio of the second response divided by the first, and then the conclusion, which is that the weakening is because of fewer ample receptors, and the reasoning for the conclusion, which relates to this idea that if we change the presynaptic terminal, then that would change the dynamics from one pulse to the, to the next and explaining because the presynaptic terminal is where both, excuse me, where both calcium buildup happens and vesicle depletion happens, if we change the presynaptic terminal, one of those things is going to change. That's the first kind of question. Just asking you to explain the paper to me and explain it clearly. The second kind of question here is to ask you to apply this knowledge to a new scenario. So, for example, I might say, in some disease that we haven't talked about or some disease that I make up or whatever, I could say that in uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, you have the hypothesis that um, synaptic connections from the motor cortex to the spinal motor neurons are weaker because of less glutamate being released. And so in order to uh, assess that, um, I would say maybe you have a mouse that has um, a genetic manipulation that gives it Lou Gehrig's disease. And so what are you going to do with that? The most straightforward approach to that um, that mimics the, the approach here would be to say 
We're going to stimulate the, the, the neurons in the motor cortex, record the motor neurons in the spinal cord that are receiving synaptic input from them, and first expect that with a single stimulation it's going to be weaker, and second, because our hypothesis now is that it's weaker because of a change in the presynaptic terminal, that we're going to see a different ratio, a higher ratio of second response divided by first response if we give a pair of pulses. And then again, explain why that justifies that response. That ALS example is essentially asking us how we can use a very similar method to test um, a different hypothesis in a different disease. There's another example here involving autism spectrum disorder that you should review. The third kind of question that I might ask, and one that is often very difficult, is to ask you about some of the limitations of these. Um, for example, a lot of these papers are done in mice and not in humans. That's a significant limitation. I might ask you for a second limitation that doesn't relate to that. And you should consider, for example, um, that in this case, um, they are looking at mice that completely lack the gene as opposed to mice that have um, OCD-like behaviors um, in a way that is more similar to what humans have, which is maybe because of genetic risk, but not this massive gene removal that you never see in humans that is, um, that is going to be um, dissimilar from any human case of OCD. Another kind of question that I might ask you is to ask you to think about a follow-up experiment that you might do. The Ann Graviel and um, Susanna Mari papers are nice follow-ups to this paper. Um, but another way that you might follow this up is to ask, for example, why are the synapses weaker? What is the connection between the SAPAP3 gene and the loss of AMPA receptors? Um, how you might assess that is to say, um, in neurons, we'll let the neurons develop normally, and then we will add in um, or so rather take away the SAPAP3 gene later in life and see what happens to the AMPA receptors. This kind of question is one that is more advanced and is less likely to appear in such an open-ended form on the first exam because we haven't yet built a full set of methods up. However, as we continue to build up more methods throughout the course of this semester, it's going to become more and more um, uh, reasonable for you to be thinking about how to apply a different method we learned from our conversation about Tourette syndrome to studying something else that we're talking about like OCD or schizophrenia. And so you should be thinking about how you can use some of these methods in other contexts as we're working through this. Um, another kind of question that I might ask you is one of comparison. So how does this uh, work compare to other work? Um, there are explicit questions on the practice exam asking you about how the Amari and Graviel studies compare with each other, but you might also want to compare, for example, um, the um, Anne Graviel study with this one here involving the original characterization of SAPF3 mice. In here, what we find is that the synapses are weaker, and then for Anne Graviel, what she found is when she activates those synapses, symptoms get better. There's sort of a clear relationship between those, um, and they seem to align with the idea that less activity is what's causing this, um, this disease. The last kind of question that I ask, which is often the most difficult, is one where I ask you, what if the results had been different? So I might say, um, in an alternate universe, perhaps, we do the exact same experiment that was done here, but what we find is that the ratio of synaptic responses when we give two pulses, the ratio of the second response divided by the first response, is different in knockout mice than wild type mice. This is challenging because it's asking you to think about something that didn't actually happen, but the goal is to test that you understand the different possible results that could have happened and how to interpret them. So, if in this alternate universe, our knockout mice had shown a higher ratio of second pulse divided by first pulse, then we would conclude that the amount of neurotransmitter released on the second pulse compared to the first is 
that the, that this that these synaptic dynamics are different in the mutant mice as compared to the wild type mice. The only way these synaptic, synaptic dynamics could be different is if there is a change in the presynaptic terminal, probably fewer calcium channels, and that's why the synapse would be weaker. That's not what was actually observed, but you should be able to think about these sort of counterfactual cases of what if they'd seen that? How would that change the interpretation? Related to that, I could also ask you, for example, in another disease, say you do an experiment in another disease, you find that in the diseased animals, they have weaker synapses. And in those diseased animals, you find that the ratio, when you give two stimulations on the axons, is uh, higher than the controls and ask you to interpret that. Or even more tricky, I guess, would be if I said, you've got some disease, you look in brain area X, whatever it is, the intramedial pallidum, and synapses are stronger. You do a pair of pulses and you find that the ratio of second pulse divided by first pulse is smaller. What does that tell you and why? So all those sorts of questions test your ability to think about the possible results of these kinds of experiments and how the interpretation would be different if we had those other possible results.